I wanted to ask you, Carlo, a little bit about the genesis of the film, because I read that you had some family history that played into it with your grandmother, who was lobotomized for a hand-washing compulsion. And I was curious how much detail you knew about that family history and how that really played into the way that you shaped the film when you came up with the concept. Yes, uh, the film was... The speakers are just over there. Oh, so. I guess it's working. Uh, the film was uh, yeah inspired by my grandmother, who was a homemaker in the 1950s, who was in an unhappy marriage and developed various rituals of control. She was an obsessive hand washer who would go through four bars of soap a day and 12 bottles of rubbing alcohol a week. And my grandfather, at the behest of the doctors, put her into a mental institution where they gave her electroshock therapy, insulin shock therapy, and a non-consensual lobotomy, and she lost her sense of taste and smell. And I always thought that there was something punitive about it, you know, that she was being punished in a way for not living up to society's expectations of what they felt a wife or mother should be, and I uh, wanted to make a film about that. Yeah. And for you, Haley, because when you're deciding whether to take on a project as an actor, there's so much beyond just the script. What were some of the things about Carlo as a director, the way that he was approaching the story, and those things beyond the pages that you were reading that really drew you into wanting to play this character? Well, when I first read the script, I was shocked and um, beguiled by uh, the subject and also by this um, compulsion. Um, but I guess um, on a, on a uh, personal um, standpoint, I, fe I, I, I felt um, I had a lot of empathy and sympathy for the character and, and um, the, the, the experience she was going through was something that I was that I felt familiar with, this feeling of um, wanting to um, meet other people's expectations and to um, try to be perfect so that I could get love um, or get a job or, you know, um, all of those all of those feelings, it, it really brought all of that stuff to the surface. And so I was really interested in how this compulsion was the thing that kind of brought her out of her, her apathy and how sometimes really negative things could bring us to the light or negative experiences could bring us to the light, whether, um, and in and, and this instance, this being this really fascinating compulsion. And then I met with Carlo, and and he told me about his grandmother's story, and um, and and his his passion to tell this story um, was what really drew me to um, closer to the project, and um, and ultimately, I um, I took on a producerial role, and so in this wonderfully symbiotic moment, the uh, the 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 content matched the the process. Yeah. And you had some really wonderful um, producers working alongside you on the film with Molly Asher and Manette Louie. What was some of the work that they did in terms of supporting the film and helping you to creatively shape it as you pulled everything together? Well, one of the things they don't often teach you in film schools is if you want to make a great movie, you got to work with incredible producers, you know? And I remember I asked my colleague who were the best producers in the business, and they said, Molly Asher and Manette Louie, but you'll never get them. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to try. And amazingly, they agreed to make the film, and they just became, uh, uh, you know, these deeply inspiring and um, brilliant collaborators that, uh, you know, we were a wonderful team. And, um, you know, we spent a lot of time, uh, you know, I did a lot of rewrites of the, s of the, of the script, and you know, they gave me amazing notes. And then, you know, when the time came to uh, uh, get the film made, of course, they fought with everything they had to, to try to get it financed, which was a bit of a challenge. And we got a little bit of money from Sundance Catalyst, but the majority of the funding came from from France, who took a chance on on us. And uh, so, uh, yeah, great producers. Yeah. It's a, it's and in telling the story and the character of Hunter, there's so many beautiful, nuanced moments between the lines on the script as well. There's a lot of silence and a lot of moments without dialogue. So, how did the two of you work together collaboratively to to fill in those gaps between the words on the page? Want to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess we, in the um, developmental stages, even before we um, were on set together, we had a really great opportunity to um, work on character um, just 
he would come over and we would discuss character and little moments and and then I think um, we went on scouts together as well and uh, we would kind of um, add little nuances and and I I guess um, I don't know it just felt so it felt so incredibly collaborative um, do you yeah, have anything to add? Oh, I, it was like a, we had like some kind of telepathic bond or something. Yeah. You know, there was a, was a real like meeting of the minds. And from that first meeting, we really just were finishing each other's sentences and were so excited to tell the story. And um, you were so incredibly generous with your time. I've, I feel like I've been spoiled now because we had so much time to work together before the, the And it really so wasn't much, that so much. much we say there was so much time. But yeah. Usually people have like six months of pre-production and right. we really, <laughs> by the time we met, we had like maybe two months working together. Right. Um, right. But it was, you know, it was like an everyday basis of yeah. conversation and um, Yeah, there was a lot of train um, rides. Train and rides and yeah, great, great discussions about the character and the, you know, the environment, environment, the journey, and yeah, there was uh, there's so many uh, amazing. And I remember that moment on set when we first arrived, and it felt like this wonderful culmination of all the things we'd been discussing. It was like the character th that first day when we shot the first shot, and you touched the ba your hair, which is the first shot of the movie, actually. Is the first, and that I was actually was really worried that everyone was going to think I was absolutely insane, or that I was working on a kind of different film. Really? <laughs> we had all planned. Like, I was like, I don't know if anybody, I, I don't know. Like, you sometimes have to take these risks, and I think, um, you know, there there's very specific characteristics of Hunter that I thought could be alarming to people, like her voice and um, mm. the way that she relates with herself, I guess. Um, and I didn't know if that would be off-putting to anyone or like, I remember working with an actor just feeling like, I feel like they have no, I like <laughs> they have no idea who they're in this scene with or how this <laughs> like relates with the <laughs> <laughs> Well, I remember, uh, you know, you, you're, you're so incredible with, with uh, uh, layers of emotion. You know, you're so sk uh, skilled at like, Wearing, because Hunter wears multiple masks throughout the film. You know, there's that first mask that's like the the the, the reflecting what everyone's expecting her to be, the the, the the placid smile reflection of normal. So that second mask is like, you know, your pain, your doubt, and the third mask is kind of Hunter's like, you know, primal self threatening to emerge. And you could deliver all of those simultaneously with just the twitch of your eye, the touch of your hair, and. So I, I had the best seat in the house. I was just mesmerized watching your performance by the monitor, you know. Um, yeah. I also wanted to talk specifically about the scenes where Hunter is picking up the objects and, and having that internal moment because it feels like you capture so many elements of what she's thinking in the entire process. And how did you figure out what the right tone and the right approach for those scenes was going to be? Um, I went through the script basically and uh, I had a different relationship with um, every object. Um, so I knew, I mean obviously you see a marble and a, a thumbtack and all of those horrible things that I ate in the film. Um, but my relationship and my experience was something completely, it was completely emotional and, and not so tactile. Um, and so just preparation, really. And then when you were writing the script, Carlo, how did you mm. think about what those objects were going to be? Because one of the interesting things about the condition is that there's so many different things that people right. gravitate towards, and you have everything from metal objects to dirt within the film, and they all say different things about this character. Yeah, I wanted each of the objects to reflect a different kind of emotional memory. Um, and if you listen to the sound design, you can hear, like, over the marble kind of a you know, a, a beach scene, you know, something, the marble seemed almost magical to us, like a kind of a, you know, a mystical talisman uh, from childhood, something that we're calling back to a, a different time. Mm -hmm. Whereas the thumbtack was like a mm -hmm. kind of um, dangerous, uh, you know, kind of uh, liaison. And then, so, um, whereas, you know, other objects, um, like the, the battery is kind of an electric thing and the, the dirt is sort of comfort food, you know. But, um, you know, and we worked closely with how each of those would be would be different. And I think with yeah. Kate Arismendi, yeah. our DP, um, there's there's this whole 
cumulative. 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 Thank you. Um, uh, atmos the atmosphere, the cinematography, the sound design, um, uh, the relationship w uh, between the objects and Hunter. I think it's just this whole cum cumulative. <laughs> Uh, what the audience is experiencing. Um, so it's not one yeah. person that's really, it's a, it's a whole. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, um, we were so fortunate to work with this, am this amazing design team. Kate Arzmendi's cinematography is just breathtaking and she's like a s you know, visual uh, genius. And Erin uh, uh, McGill, our amazing production designer, you know, who's so in such an incredible, you know, imaginative artist, and uh, and Leanna DeBroja, our costume designer. So it was a great synergy between all the departments. Leanna was amazing, um, and so um, I think also that um, we wanted to, in the writing, I wanted to make sure that there would be some event that would happen just before the object that would sort of trigger the emotion, you know? We want it to be kind of universal story, so that even though this is kind of a rare compulsion, someone may look at it and feel, you know, I with your incredibly empathic performance that, that well, okay, I wouldn't necessarily do that, but I understand why she's feeling this way. And the, the you know, uh, con the sort of, you know, patriarchal restrictions and controls that she's rebelling from. And because you mentioned the sound design, I feel like this film has the highest level of specificity in terms of the sound design that I've seen in a while. So how did you set about capturing that and making that such a central part of the, the film? Well, we had a lot of incredible people working on the sound, like uh, Michael Kirihara, who's our, our sound editor. And, and, and we were in conversation, you know, he was very passionate about the idea of, of using a lot of Foley's. I mean, we really, a lot of, well, you know, a lot of the sounds that you hear were made by this amazing, you know, by him in this amazing Foley house where like every little thing you hear has this tactile sensation to it. It's, you know, been created. But I think you're yeah. the driving force. I mean, he obviously took your lead because Carlo would become so obsessed with the objects and the sound <laughs> like, isn't that your, Throat? There are some sounds <laughs> of mine in there. No, in um, the when in the the, photo, the picture of your th when the surgery is happening. Wait, D no, didn't you do no. the? Didn't oh you no! Put that down your I did not. Oh, I, um, thought, I thought he did. We were considering it because oh, wait, we could not get that footage, <laughs> but luckily we found that footage. Um, <laughs> but I was willing uh, to do it for no, but for you art. Um, for the, the I mean, the, he hunted you know. down these things like it was incredible. <laughs> yeah. What did you, I'm embarrassing him. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. No, I mean, you know, it, it's thank you for saying that. I mean, like, I, uh, what I love about telling stories is I, you know, it's, it's the immersion and the imagination and the idea that the joy of trying to tell something that hopefully makes people feel seen and connects to their emotions. And I believe the devil's in the details. And so I love, you know, that micro focus on every little noise and sound and, you know, the, the w creating a camera dire direction uh, vernacular with with Kate that you know was very specific so that you know Kate and I worked a lot so that everything would feel very rigid and controlled and then when Hunter has her emotional breakthroughs or her psychological you know uh, breakthroughs then uh, we introduce a little handheld or we you know suddenly will throw it you know start using more close-ups and shallow dip of the field so yeah I'm obsessed with all those and because you touched upon the, the therapist scenes, those were one of my favorite things because so often when we have scenes like that in movies or TV shows, it feels like just a way to get some dialogue off and get, get information. So how did you, when you were crafting the film, make sure that that was really going to be a vehicle that was moving the story forward and was a central part of it? That's an interesting question. Um, um, from a performance standpoint, because we didn't have a lot of time in that, um, in that house. So I think um, just for me, it was the preparation. Um, and every, um, uh, I guess, um, therapist session, it was a, a completely, I, I wanted to make sure that that was varying and there was a, a different communication happening or something that we're learning that's new. And obviously, um, you know, there's the pitfalls of what, she's talking about and just for it to be very kind of there to be humor and it not being kind of this heavy uh i think one of them or the one where she's going oh i just i um i don't know why everybody thinks that this is such a big deal it's not a big deal 
And I think that those could be played like really on the downbeat, but because of the rhythm and the fact that we just didn't have any time, um, the rhythms kind of uh, were um, driving the story forward. Yeah, we shot all those scenes in one day. I also read something interesting where you were saying that you, uh, Carlo, you and your cinematographer created a very specific set of rules for shooting in a confined space. And I was mm. curious what those rules were that you came up with and, and how that worked on set. Right. So, well, first of all, Kate came up with this great idea to shoot on master prime lenses. So these these lenses are ha capture the texture of things, with incredible focus. And we talked a lot about the idea that pica is about the texture of things. You know, people that have pica talk about that. So Kate and I, you know, we really wanted the idea that at first the frame would feel very locked down. A lot of master shots, not a lot of movement. And that Hunter, especially when we filmed her in public when other with other people, would be kind of like um, lost in the frame a little bit. Or other people would be kind of like, it would, it would feel kind of con like a prison. The frame itself would become a prison. And that when she had her moments with the objects, that something almost hypnotic would happen. And then we would use shallow let depth of field, and then we would enter into her world. And by co contrast and comparison, you know, you would feel the difference between these moments of private rebellion and then, you know. Pain. Exactly. Um, and then there's a, what we held off handheld for most of the film until this one moment, the moment with the thumbtack. And I think it's so startling and great when the camera gets up and goes, with her. Um, and then as the film progresses, we actually, the film itself has a very stylized feel in the beginning, and as the movie progresses, both with the camera direction and with the design, and I think and your voice changes a little bit voice, too, yeah. it becomes all, all more and more realistic. Yeah, to, to more grounded. Yeah, to, to reflect the Hunter's sort of rebellion from that old world 50s, you know, kind of patriarchal universe into more discovering who she is and what she wants. Mm. And the costumes. Um, we got really lucky because uh, uh, we I had a lot of conversations with Liana, the costume designer, and c um, uh, with um, our set designer, Aaron. Uh, Aaron Miguel. Um, how Hunter, you'll notice in the beginning, every she's very colorful and full of life and kind of wearing these masks, and her environment's very kind of dull and, uh, you know, in this patriar patriarchal world. And then as time goes by, she's being literally drained of her, her life force, her color, and the um, the environment takes her color. And we were, it was amazing because like, I, as I said, it was only a 20 day shoot. And as we were shooting, because we were shooting mainly in one location, the glass house, um, the trees, um, tur it, it turned from fall to, uh, sorry, from winter to, to spring. And so as, and we shot, basically in chronological order. And so as she was losing her color, the trees took on color. And so this is kind of a little subtle details and luck really um, that this happened. And in terms of, of playing the character of Hunter, obviously you did so much prep work. You guys had all those conversations that you were mentioning. But what were some of the elements that you discovered about her as you were playing her and as you were shooting the film? Um. I think because I did so much preparation that the performance was oddly very kind of controlled in a way. Um, my relationships, I guess, like my relationship with Carlo changed and grew, um, but really all of the prep work that I did, everything kind of, there wasn't a, a ton of, I had a reference book, um, I had a, a vision book, um, and I reference that a lot. And so I guess, I, I, in a way, to be honest, I was experiencing these things as they were happening. You can do all of the preparation. And then you get to set, and it t completely takes on a life of its own. And um, in a way, I guess, I guess I was learning everything and nothing at the same time. There's such an interesting relationship in the film between Hunter and her in-laws as well, I thought. Um, and how did you kind of work with them as scene partners to, to figure out what that dynamic was going to be and how you're going to play off against each other? Um, Elizabeth Marvel's fantastic. David Raish is fantastic. Um, <laughs> this sounds really odd. Um, no. In a way, again, preparation being everything. Um, they were in a way like the objects to me. Um, 
Uh, yeah. yeah. And then also <laughs> later in the film, obviously, we have the, the scene with Dennis O'Hare. And there's so many layers to that scene to unpack through his performance. So I was interested, Carlo, in, in how mm. you worked with him in unpacking the different levels, because we see so, diff so many different aspects of his personality and his character and who he is in just one scene. I don't want to talk too much about it because I know this is going online and that's a sort of a scene that we, is we want people to experience in the movie. Um, but I'll say that he's an incredible actor. Um, and your performance with him, the two of you together, was just stunning. And we, um, the, the actually that day when we arrived on set, um, all we did one take of you, and it was the first take, and all the performances from that were you, from that first one take. Did you say David Raish or? Uh, David O'Hare. Oh, David O'Hare. Uh, De Dennis O'Hare. Dennis, Dennis, Dennis O'Hare. Oh um, but uh, so that was this amazing thing where I think we'd been building up. Yeah. You'd had that for the whole film, and that was our final yeah. shoot, and it all just came out in this in this magnificent performance that gives me chills every time I see you on the screen you there. Sure. And then, uh, interestingly, with. With um, with Dennis, s the moment we finished with yours, a plane the planes were rerouted over the building, <laughs> and every fifteen seconds there we had to hold. It wasn't by choice that we only did one take. Yeah. No, no, it was. <laughs> it was we did, we well, uh, well yeah. no, it was. We kind of had it, but yeah. also we didn't really have a choice right, because, because we couldn't do any more. <laughs> no, but that take when I saw it, we were I no. I knew. But the um, but then with Dennis, yeah. So he I had to keep saying in the middle of his performance, like hold. And That's he did right. this incredible thing That's where he just, just kind of like close his eyes and stay in the character and think about what's going on and then action and then he would jump right back in it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in that yeah, moment. We, <laughs> <I don't remember. laughs> we were just staring and he was going, hold. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But he, you know, you see a, with that character a lot of different personas that then shift and crack and change and he's so good at the nuances of sort of leaping between all those different emotions and identities and uh, yeah, we're really lucky to work with him. And in terms of the, the makeup of the crew, I read that it was a very predominantly female crew. Was that a very specific choice on, on your end and how do you feel for both of you that that lent itself to the telling of this story and character? Uh, I mean, the framing of, of uh, uh, the, the framing of the film was... Um, it was of the utmost importance that it was framed by, um, I think, 80% women. All the department heads. All the department heads. I mean, li when I tell you this was a small crew, there was 25, 25 30 people on set. Um, and you look around and you see all of these magnificent female faces. And it's just, it was so inspiring. Uh, Aaron, our, our set production designer, Kate, um, board lady, <laughs> who's my friend, Emma, hello. Um, uh, um, Leanna, Molly, um, Carlo here, practically. No, 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 it's, no. An, it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, we were, um, you know, it's interesting because I was uh, we're very con I was very concerned. My producers and I, when we started the film, I was worried about uh, my male gaze and that it would somehow affect the film. And m my amazing producers, Molly Asher and Minette Louie and I, we were all concerned about this. And instead of just saying, "Well, I'll, it'll be fine," we decided to spend a lot of time talking about it and addressing it and figuring out how we could counteract that and how we could, you know, um, uh, create an environment that would um, make the story feel, you know, authentic. And so. I was so fortunate that so many incredible female artists, you know, decided to take my grandmother's story and make it make it their own. So it, it was an it was an amazing um, group of people. And um, what Haley's referring to is that in my tw uh, you know I was raised in a very feminist family, and my grandmother's story was kind of always on my mind. In my twenties, um, for about four and a half years, I, I actually identified as a woman, and I wore women's clothing, and I had a different name. And there was this inc incredible time in my life that was just like a this this you know, wonderful, n you know, time of, of, lo of creativity and, uh, um, and joy. And, uh, and it was also... A so you do have experience living well, under well the male gaze. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I mean, no, it was interesting. I mean, even just, you know, raised as a man, you know, you don't always realize how baked into the cake of s society sexism is, you know, and just walking down the street at that time and seeing the way that, m you know, m uh, the world views female-identified people was a real eye-opener, you know, getting... You know, people cat calling me on the street, men trying to touch me. It was a whole different thing, and I realized, wow, this is, you know, that that the society is constantly trying to control female 
you know, people. And that was, that was really important. It solidified a lot of my feminist beliefs and made me want to make a, you know, a film about some of those gender expectations. And also, I know I'm not supposed to talk about it, but so... F <laughs> what do you... What do you <laughs> <laughs> like a... <laughs> um, the fact that this film uh, deals with issues that so few films in history have dealt with um, and the way that you handled it with such delicacy and sensitivity and um, I never felt exploited in any way. Um, uh, but that was of the utmost importance to me. I saw a film recently that really inspired me. It was called A Portrait of a Woman on Fire. And those are the kinds of films that I want to make. And I feel like we've achieved that. That's so wonderful. Going through the whole experience of, of making this film, I was curious for each of you what you feel you learned the most about your specific craft from this project. Oh, that's a question. Preparation is everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, really. How about for you, Carlo? Um, and, and the writing and finding the right script um, and choosing fantastic co-collaborators, mm. collaborators yeah. that allow you to have a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to reiterate that, that to surround yourself with amazing artists and you're going to make a good movie, you know? Um, and thank you for telling the story and bringing Hunter to life with such power and grace and, and specificity and My joy. honor. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Um, so, yeah, and I also realized, like, you know, that um, it's important as a writer or a creator of any kind to, and as an actor to push yourself, you know, Tr to be daring, try to do something bold and dangerous and maybe something you're a storyteller to tell a story you're frightened to tell a little bit, you know what I mean, or something that you are really passionate about that you desperately yeah. want to put out there into the world. I mean, it's we're motivated by the hearth fires of our passion and beliefs and our souls, you know, make something that you feel is, is you know, part of your soul and you're going to do, uh, you know, powerful work. I, I think that's, you know, you got to, yeah, that, that would be what I've learned. I absolutely love it, and the film absolutely feels powerful. The film is coming out Friday, March 13th via IFC tell Film, your so friends. please tell yes. your friends and family to go see the film. We need thank word you. of And mouth. thank you both for coming thank out you. to have this conversation with us today. And thank you for having us, Sag. Thank you for having Astra. us. Thank, thank you, you for, for coming. coming out. Appreciate it. <laughs>